we're here to the Rock and Pine Town, and it's great. And uh, can anybody guess what I'm going to be talking on this morning? You are so astute. It's unbelievable. This, 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 you're so good this morning. Right, so we're going to talk about a parable. It's a wheat and tear. It's found in Matthew chapter 13, and we're going to look at verse 24 through to verse 30 initially, because this is the initial part. Jesus in Matthew 13 gives a few parables, and these parables are pretty agricultural. He just spoke about the sower, and he's explained how the sower sowed the seed. The seed was the word of God, and he is the word of God. We know that Jesus was the word. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. But here he changes a little bit for the wheat and the tares. And you know what? Uh, I could have wrote the wheat and the weeds, and you may have understood it a little bit better. Because I know coming up from Ireland, um, tares, um, if someone, it means to run fast. And, you know, the, the guy's tearing up the road. He's running up the road. Yeah, so uh, wheat and tares, not to be confused with wheat and running. Okay, so it's, it's wheat and tares. Tares are uh, plants that grow right alongside the wheat. They look just like the wheat. Um, and it's, sometimes it's very uh, difficult to distinguish them. So... My question today, too, will be, because when, I, when you walk out of this place, I want you to leave, I don't want you to leave with a whole lot of t- different thoughts. I mean, when I go to bed at night, I'm thinking everything. Uh, bed, my wife will say, I'm thinking of all, what are we doing tomorrow? What's that, that, the planning, we've got that to do, the next to do. Next time I know, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'm up drinking chamomile tea. And it's, <clears throat> and it's, not, it's not working. But this parable, Jesus tells this parable, the Bible says he tells it to a multitude. And he tells it to a multitude, and then he sends the multitude away. He doesn't explain it to them. It's like, here's this, take it, I'm off. And that's, that's, the, that's the impression that we're getting. Now, we see this world. We don't have to go far to see evil in the world. You, we don't even have to turn your TV on. You can just walk around the streets. You see evil in this world. And it, it, it's shocking, but the television, all the television channels, that, that, all the news channels, uh, social media, all you're getting is uh, protests, fighting, wars, um, devastations, earthquakes, building collapses, floods, hurricanes, and that's only the adverts. I mean, can you imagine what the programs are going to be like? So... <clears throat> We are coming into a, a world which we think we think is becoming a darker place. And having said that, a lot of Christians are excited about that. Okay, we're coming to a darker place. That's happening. That's happening, and they get excited. And do you know why? Because we're focusing on the wrong thing. We shouldn't be focusing on the darkness that's coming around. We should be focusing on the light, and the light is Christ Jesus. And too often, and if I was to preach about the Antichrist, if I was to put it out that the Antichrist is coming, and I'm going to actually tell who he is, and because I find it, I have no problems with it, this place, we would, we would pack it out. If I was to talk about the tribulation, when does it start? Has it started? Is it going to start? When is it? The rapture. What is the rapture? People disappearing off the earth. When is that going to happen? Is it going to happen be, before Armageddon, after Armageddon? What's it going to be like? The millennium. Are, are there going to be sinners in millennium? Are, are, or is everybody there going to be okay? Is everybody going to be saved? If I was to talk about things like that, people will be hanging on every word. But if I was to say to you, what I want you to do is to love your neighbor. And you start, <laughs> the faces just sort of deplete a bit. Think, well, that's, you know, that's not really what we, you know, amen, brother. <laughs> love our neighbor. Then you go home and you fight with someone at work or someone at family. Um, anywhere. Uh, you, people will start, you know, my mom used to say to me when I was a kid, she says, you know what, you could start a fight in an empty house. <clears throat> and uh, she was probably, probably right. It was because I used to speak too much. But you know what? Uh, if we speak about our loving neighbors, and uh, we get a different response. But you know what? Being a, a child of God, Jesus said to his disciples, Matthew 28, go into all the world, He's teaching them, baptizing them, and teaching them. Baptizing them, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them the things of what? Of what I have told you. What did he tell them? He told them about the kingdom of God. 
the kingdom of God was inaugurated when Christ was pulled off that cross and rose on the third day, and the new covenant was brought into existence, and the old covenant went away. And Jesus fulfilled it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your brothers as you love yourselves. And love is something that we find it very difficult. We find it difficult to like people. We, we, no, we don't. We can like people. I like that person. And when you like someone, um, uh, I'll not look at Wayne. When you like someone, you, you, you know, it's, it's easy to then start to love that person and, and, and to get to know them better. But when you don't like someone... Sorry, when you don't like someone, um, it, 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 the love's not there. And love is not about liking. It's not about emotion. It's about action. It's about what Christ has put in us. It's about living as Jesus lived. Jesus spoke to the people. He spoke to all of them. He spoke to the sinners, the prostitutes. He spoke to the tax gatherers, the publicans. He spoke to all of the people. He didn't leave anybody out. For God so loved the world that he came that whosoever, that whosoever believeth him should not perish but have everlasting life. But the thing is today, with churches, and you get on, I'm sure a lot of you have got TV stations where you tune into, and a lot of them will be prosperity. Ones where, yes, you believe, look how good I've got. I've got my own aeroplane, and I can fly here, and I can fly there. I can fly all over the place. Um, we can look at pe people and, and uh, uh, they've got the, the latest Armani suits wearing. And, and you know, the, ma the majority of people throughout the world are, are poor. And they look at some of these guys and think, you, if we could only do that. I remember at a Bible study, uh, you were talking about a Bible study, Steph, even before mine, years ago, there was a guy there and, and he, was, uh, he had come from being a Muslim into a, be a Christian and he said, but he had to buy a better car. How to get a bigger car? How to have a Mercedes, the latest Mercedes? He says, because how is he going to attract the Muslims? He says, they've got to see that the Christians will, are, are more prosperous. And that he was missing the whole thing. It's, not, it's got nothing to do with that. But we have the wheat and the tares, Matthew 13, verse 24. But when I would talk about the wheat and the tares, and we're going to, it's going to be interesting because I'm going to tell you something that you don't know. In it, I, I promise you that there's something in it that's, that you're not going to have ever heard of before, and you want to walk out there and you say, "I think that Irishman's pulled the wool over our eyes here," <laughs> but it's not. You, you can you can examine it, and you can you, you can actually test it, and you'll see that it's that it's true. But you know, speak about it, throw it out. Come expect a healing. Bring your crutches and your wheelchairs, and just we'll throw them away, and this place would be fire, uh, packed out. Well, if I was to say, come along, we need your commitment, we need your discipline, we need your disciples, we need you here regularly, we need your money to keep the church going. Oh, that's, whoa, those, those sermons aren't so great. Three pastors together, and the three of them had a problem. Um, the one pastor says to the other one, he says, you know what, really my biggest problem, one of these big English churches, you know, with the huge steeples and, and the attics and all sorts of things, he says, I've got bats in my belfry. He said, and I just can't get rid of them. He says, and we've tried noise uh, extermination. It doesn't get rid of them. Um, we, we have tried all sorts of things to get rid of these things. It, they keep coming back. The other one said, the other pastor said, you know, I have exactly the same problem with, with these bats. He says, the same thing. He says, they're there every week. He says, I have even had the church and the ceiling and the, and the attic fumigated, and it's, they're still there. I don't know what to do. The third one says, I don't have one. He says, I used to have a lot. I said, how did you get rid of them? He says, well, I caught them all, baptized them, made them church members, and explained about tithing. He says, I haven't seen one since. <laughs> all right. But there's always been an attack on, on good. You know, we've got good and evil. There's always been an attack on good from the, from the Garden of Eden, the paradise. Remember, God made the paradise, and in the paradise there was a talking snake. Okay, and the snake was the one that beguiled, that, that, that deceived, very subtle. And, and it was very, very subtle the way it twisted God's words. And that's what happens today. There's a lot of subtlety in changing the word of God. But there's, you know, we can be in a, 
we can be in a power. We can be in a place. I remember I was talking in different places, and um, one of them was in that in, the little uh, Indian place down in was it Phoenix? In Phoenix, a guy had a double garage, and he had you know he went out about five or six times to pick people up. And I thought, wow, this guy, unbelievable. And uh, we, I was there, uh, was ministering there. And it was such a, a humbling experience to see what God is doing. And God is saving a people. And you know what? The, 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 the paradise that, that I was at, finished talking, and the paradise... I was in the car and I was feeling really good. You really felt good sometimes when you got that. You think, you walk out of church and think, "Wow, well, you know what? Yeah, I mean, I've had that before in my life when I was younger. I used to be, oh, I'll pray for this and that and the other. and it'll, They'll all change. What do you want? Well, I'll walk around it seven times and pray and claim it and you've got it. And we'll save Durban by going all around Durban and, and, and binding up all the principalities. They should bind up the municipalities. I don't know about the principalities. And, and he said, and all of these things. And, but you know what? When I came away from those little church services, when I came away, I would run into a taxi driver or, or somebody on the road or a truck. And my Christianity, I am so glad I don't have a Christian bumper sticker on the car, especially one that says the rock on it, you know, he was, oh, gee, was that guy, was he talking in tongues to us? <laughs> yes, he was, there were English tongues. Anyway, so the thing is, paradise isn't uh, the absence of evil. Really, it isn't. In, fa in fact, paradise isn't even the denial of absence of evil. In other words, not allowing it in. Paradise is recognizing, your paradise is recognizing that there is evil. You will have a snake in your paradise. But the difference is you know how to handle it. You know what tree to eat from. And that would be the difference. And that's, that's what's so exciting because the Bible's telling us and always leads us to Jesus Christ, always leads us through the power of God. All right, so what we're going to do, we're going to read this. Um, you're going to, uh, we're going to go through this PowerPoint and have a look and see. And we're going to start Matthew 13, verse 24 to 30. This particular part of the parable is when Jesus is talking to the multitude. Okay, I'll get through it as quickly as I can. 24, another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and pro produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? The servant said to him, Do you want us to go and then and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, when we see that, when we hear that, we think, well, we're the wheat. And we're quite, happy that the tares are going to be burnt because that's evil. Evil's going to be burnt. And we were talking the other day, my wife and I, Bev, and we were, we were talking about different people through the years, like Hitler, Idi Amin, Robert Mugabe, and you know, all the way through. And we were saying, these guys, they could have got saved at the last moment. And we, can't, we, we, we can't judge. We, we can't, we're not here to judge. But, but you know, you think of things like that. I'm not saying they were. I'm just saying... These, all these things are possible with God. So that's the first part of the parable. And that's what, now what I find here is that it's strange because what happens next is he tells this part of the parable. He goes on to something else. He, he sends the multitude. He sends the multitude away. And they, the, the, the servants have come to him and said, hey, you've, you've planted good seed, but the enemy has come along. So not everything in this world is our fault because 
we can do whatever we can do. We can be the, one of the best prayer warriors in town. We can be reading the scriptures and understanding them, the, one of the best in town. We can be all of these people. We can, we can do that. We can be good as we can, we can give money to the poor, but do it to the glory of God. We can do all of that, and that would be fantastic. But you're still going to have evil. So, and you know, people say, oh, what's God doing about this? And what's God, how does God allow that? And what, you know, what are the churches doing? And then they look at the churches and they say, look at the churches. And, and they start ridiculing the churches. What we've got to look at is we have got to look at what we are supposed to do. We don't have put guilt on, on the church. There is evil in this world. And there is, it doesn't matter what we do. Doesn't matter how much fruit of the Lord we're going to show. Evil is still going to be here. You see, the reason is we're not meant to change the world. Now, this is where a lot of Christians, oh, I'm probably walking out of this camera frame. <laughs> That's where a lot of Christians, they believe that they've got to change the world. But you don't. The only world that you can change, be, let's be realistic. The only world you can change is yours. Yeah, you can't even change your kids. And you can't change your grandkids. And you can't change your neighbors, and you can't change the people that you meet in the supermarkets. But you have got a control over your own life, and you can change it. That's the world you can change, and that's the world Jesus wants you to change. He says, I want you to accept me, to accept Christ Jesus. Let the Spirit change you inside, not your church, not your pastor, but let the Spirit change you from with inside, and you will be changed, and you will become, a, uh, Paul calls it, a, a citizen of heaven. We are citizens of heaven. And, 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 but this world, we can't just wipe our hands off and say, oh, well, okay, then in that case, we'll just sit back and do nothing. And uh, eventually the reapers are going to come and grab these guys and they're going to get their good comeuppance. That's not what God thinks. That's not the way he thinks at all. So let's just go <clears throat> a wheat and a tear. Okay, there we go. Them. That's them. You see, the wheat has is, is got, the, 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 let me just say, the wheat has got more substance. The tear is thinner and weaker, but if you look at them, you can see that there is a difference, okay? Now, just before I move on to the next picture, I just want to explain that the wheat produces grain that produces food. Uh, the tear produces fodder. It's, it's, it's used for nothing much, but the wheat is used, and therefore, what Jesus is saying in this, in this parable that the wheat, the, he sowed the, the word, and the wheat are the children of God. We're coming to that now. Please bear with me. Right. Now, you saw the last picture, and you saw the two differences. Now, I sort the differences out. <laughs> now, go into that field and sort out the wheat and the tares, and you can't. Many years ago, I belonged to a church called the Invisible Church, and people used to laugh. And they say, oh, invisible church, we can't see it. And it's true. You cannot see the true church. The true church are the body of believers. You can see the building. You can see the people in the building. But you, you can't see what's in their hearts. Only God can. So Jesus then, he gives an explanation. And this is interesting. I find this interesting. And Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parables of the tares of the field. By the way, uh, weeds are smaller than tares. Tares grow up as high as the weeds, as the wheat. Verse 37, he answered and said to them, he who sows the good seed, now he's explaining it. Why is he explaining it? Because the disciples came to him. He sent the multitude away, and the disciples came to him, and he started to explain it. He says, he who sows the good seed is the son of man, Jesus. Verse 38, the field is the world, and the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. In other words, believers, you guys are the wheat. All right? You are the wheat. So, you know, so when we read that, we're, we're quite happy there. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is is the end of the age, and the reapers are, he explains it, the angels. They're the guys who are going to pull up the tares. 
Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather all things out of his kingdom, all things that offend those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has an ear, let him hear. And that is, that's the part that we like. That's the part that we enjoy. You know, uh, we know that they're going to get their comeuppance. We know we're going to get our reward. We know that this is going to happen. But what are we doing in the meantime? We are growing up with tares beside us. And we don't know whether those tares beside us are wheat or not. Now, why shouldn't, why doesn't he say, yeah, you go and grab those tares and pull them up? Well, you see, sometimes when, when we look at people and we decide, we decide uh, as humans, we look around and we think, well, no, that person's not right. That person's not right. That per no, mm -mm, no, you know, and we can say that to a person who God has anointed, God has saved, God has died on the cross for, and we can just, we can just dismiss them. But thank God that is not our job. That's not our job. Verse 27, so the servants, going back to the beginning of the, of the actual, I'm going back to the beginning of the parable because that's where I believe the meat is. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? In other words, we will get asked these questions in a different way. We say, why, why is there so much evil in the world? Why does God allow? Why, why? I mean, if you sow good seed, why allow somebody to come along and sow tares and weeds and stuff like that? Why? Why is there evil in the world? And Jesus has answered them. In verse 28, he said to them, an enemy has done it. His answer was simple. The enemy did it. And he goes on to say that the enemy, the sons are the sons of the wicked, and the wicked is the devil. But he says the enemy did it. He didn't go into a lot of theological explanation to them that, that, that who's done it. Now, this here, we'll see this is Jesus' answer at the beginning of the parable. He only explained the parable to the disciples. Now, you'd think he would cut to the multitude he would have explained what he explained to the disciples, to the multitude. You know, if, if it was us, we, I know Charles Spurgeon was called the prince of preachers. He would have told the people, you're, you're just a bunch of weeds. Yeah, get out and do something. Jesus didn't. His answer was simple. Who did it? The enemy did it. Nothing. You see, we often focus on, all right, well, where did Lucifer come from? Lucifer was in the heavens, and he was the head of the, 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 the choir, and he was singing, and he was so beautiful and shining, and he was everywhere God was, and, and he was God's right-hand man, and he was a fallen angel, and as he comes down, then, then we find there's going to be a false prophet, and there's going to be an antichrist, and we study the antichrist, we study the false prophet, then we want to know the dates when there's going to be the false prophet and the antichrist. And then once we get to all those dates together, we try to work it out where we are in the timeline because we're not focused on us. We're not focused on us. We're, we're supposed to focus on Christ. Christ is, is the answer. So the servant said to him, do you want to go then and gather them up? Do you want to go and gather them up? Do you want us to go and gather them up? Verse 29, but he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. In other words, let them grow. You know, people get blessings. You get Christians who get blessings. You get Christians who get absolutely horrible diseases and, and ter terrible financial and family difficulties. You will get non-Christians who will have the same. You will have non-Christians who are blessed with finances out of their socks. The rain falls on whoever, the whole lot. He says, you cannot tear them up. No, lest while you gather up your tears, you 
uproot the wheat with them. Now, let me explain. So, and Jesus is then saying, <clears throat> no, you can't do that. Now, let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, and the angels will sort it out, not us. So he's going to talk to the reapers. He's going to say, this is what's going to happen, not you. you we, that is not our job. Our job is not to do that. Our job isn't to, to focus on the tares. Our job is to focus on Christ. Our job is to focus on spreading the kingdom of God. Our job is to focus on what Jesus taught the people. That's what our focus should be. But that biggest part of the parable there is amazing. It says, no, let's both grow together. Let them both grow together. Now, what I'm saying here is that there is a word that, that I want to explain to you here. Uh, well, first of all, remember what Paul said? He said, we fight not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities in high places. In other words, we fight against the spirit world that we can't see and that we can't understand it. You know, so that's why we get depression and we get emotional and we get all sorts of stuff. Because if we put on the shield of faith and the, the helmet of salvation and the, the shoes of the gospel, we, you know, we, we would be equipped to, to handle all of this. But unfortunately, we don't. We spend so much time studying the enemy, we take our eyes off Christ. And remember what happened to Peter when he got out of the boat, took his eyes off Jesus, and he looked at the storm, and he started to go down. We often look at too much other than the Bible. We look at the news, we look at this, we look at that, and then we try to compare it and patch it all together. Not our job. We just read the Bible, and let's do it. Paul says in Romans 12, verse 19, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Vengeance... Not us. Vengeance isn't ours. We don't get to take out the tares. We don't get, that's not our job. We're not to be judges. Maybe, maybe the wheat can have an effect on the tares. Have you thought of that? Maybe the person that you think's a tear, or you think's false Christian or falsely, maybe you will have an influence on them because God doesn't want them uprooted. Why? Because harvest time isn't here yet. There is still hope. For people. He says, no, you just carry on and do your job. Now, in verse 30 there, it says, let both grow together. The actual word there for let, um, uh, it's a Greek word. It's called aphemi. It's been used a few times in the New Testament. I'm not a Greek scholar, but I do know how to do uh, study words. And it's aphemi is, is, means, it means to forgive. That's what it means. It's, uh, you know, what, what happened is the Bible from Hebrew, the Old Testament, was translated into the Septuagint, which was Greek. And then from the Greek, it was translated into the Latin. And then from the Latin, it was translated into the English. So, so we, get, we, we will get confused over certain words. So it says there, let both. Now, if, we, if I was to put in, forgive them and let them grow together. Forgive them. That's what it says, Alephia. Let both, but the transcribes or the, tra the scribes who did this, they wrote, let both grow together because that's where he understood it to be until the harvest time. It's just probably a good explanation. But alephi means forgive. It comes from the root word to forgive, forgive them. It actually means hands off. You know when the Jews used to um, have the sin offering, they would have to put their hands on and impart the sin on them. But if you take your hands off, you leave them alone. It means hands off. It says, let both grow together. Hands off. So I want to leave you here this morning. And, and uh, even though we want to pull up the tears, we must do our job. And our job is to forgive. The other time that word alephi is used is when Jesus was on the cross. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I want you to go out this morning with, in your head, something about that, what Jesus said. It's not our job to pull them up. It's our job to forgive. And let's just go out with even just that one thought in our mind. It's our job to forgive. Amen. Amen.